Making the headlines tonight. The whole of Cambodia is in mourning over the death of Prince Nodadam Ranarith as he succumbed to an illness in France on Sunday. The Prime Minister of Lao, Pon Kham V. Pavan, arrives in Cambodia, visiting King Norodam Siharmony, Prime Minister Hun Sen and other Cambodian leaders. And thousands of monkeys in Thailand feast after the town's monkey festival resumes. This is the Daily Roundup on the EAC News Channel. A very good evening to you. My name is Paolo Bonini. Cambodian leaders have expressed their grief and condolences on the sudden death of Prince Norodom Ranarith. Ranarith has succumbed to his illness on Sunday morning in France. The news shocked the whole country with both the people and the leaders expressing sorrow on the passing of the prince, the half-brother of King Norodom Siharmony. EAC news reporter Ria Soka has the story. Prime Minister Hun Sen immediately released a statement on Sunday, expressing condolences on the death of Prince Norodom Ranaret. The Prime Minister and his wife Bundrani Hun Sen say that they are deeply saddened about the death of the prince, who was the chairman of Pun Sen Pik, the royalist political party in Cambodia. Prime Minister Hun Sen says that they would like to share their condolences with the princess, the son, the daughter, and the royal family, describing the death of Prince Ranaret as the loss of a great royal figure in the royal family who is patriotic, religious, and has the will of a king. The late Prince Norodom Ranaret was a former Prime Minister of Cambodia. His royalist political party won elections in 1993, was ousted in 1997 coup by his coalition partner and rival, now Prime Minister Hun Sen. Prince Ranaret's eldest son, Prince Norodom Chakravut, has announced on Sunday evening that the remains of his father will be transported back home, although there is no date released yet as to when it will arrive in the Kingdom of Cambodia. Prince Norodom Chakravut is now the acting president of Prince Pik. Another leader, president of the Cambodian Human Rights Committee, Keo Remy, has stated that he was shocked by the death of Prince Norodom Ranaret and would have remembered many good memories with him. He has added that he was a descendant of the prince, remembering the times that he paid back his gratitude to Prince Ranaret when he was in exile in 1997 and in 2008 before the election. He says Prince Norodom Ranaret fled twice, from July 1997 to March 1998, in connection with the armed clashes between the CPP and Fun Sin Pik, and from March 2007 to September 2008, in connection with the loss of profit from the sale of party headquarters to the French embassy. Prince Norodom Ranaret was the first prime minister from 1993 to 1997 and was the speaker of the National Assembly from 1998 to 2006. Reyes Soko, EAC News. The new ambassador of the Czech Republic in Cambodia has pledged to work hard to encourage Czech investors to invest in Cambodia. The statement was made in response to a request made by the President of the National Assembly, Heng Samrin, to the Czech Republic to further promote cooperation between the two countries in the fields of trade, investment and tourism in the post-pandemic context. EAC News reporter Dashana Gochan has them all. The new ambassador of the Czech Republic in Cambodia, Martin Vavra, has paid a courtesy visit to the president of the National Assembly, Heng Samrin, on Monday morning. Heng Samrin welcomed and congratulated Martin Vavra for his new appointment by the Czech government as ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia. The National Assembly president says that Cambodia and the Czech Republic have been linked and cooperating with each other for a long time, a partnership which the two nations have always benefited from. He has also acknowledged that the Czech Republic has contributed greatly to the development of Cambodia and requested the ambassador to further promote trade, investment, and tourism in the present post-pandemic context. Ambassador Martin Vavra has agreed to the request and informed the President of the National Assembly that he will further study the promotion of trade cooperation between Cambodia and the Czech Republic, 
looking at examples of Czech companies investing in neighboring Southeast Asian countries, Thailand and Vietnam. The ambassador further highlighted that the Czech Republic has provided a lot of bilateral assistance to Cambodia in the areas of health and education, such as the recent provision of medical equipment to Takeo Provincial Hospital. He has stated that the Czech Republic will continue to provide humanitarian assistance and support to Cambodia, especially in the form of scholarships for students and Cambodian government officials who wish to study in Czech Republic. Heng Sam Rin has acknowledged the well-established education system of the Czech Republic, citing the example of King Norodom Sihamoni, who also studied there in his youth. He further stated that he believes the new diplomatic mission of the Czech Republic in Cambodia is very important and will continue to further enhance existing ties of friendship and cooperation between the two countries. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. The Prime Minister of Laos, Pong Tham V. Pavan, has led a delegation paying an official visit to Cambodia on Monday. His visit was in response to the invitation of Prime Minister Hun Sen. One of the priorities on his two-day visit in the kingdom is also to visit King Norodom Sihamoni. Lao Prime Minister Pong Tham V. Pavan first scheduled to visit was the president of the Cambodia Lao Friendship Association and Secretary of State of the Ministry of National Defense, General Ning Fad. The Lao Prime Minister also laid a wreath at the Independence Monument to pay his respect at the memorial statue of His Majesty Norodom Sihanouk, the late King Father of Cambodia. Then he proceeded to the Peace Palace to meet with Prime Minister Hun Sen. Prime Minister Hun Sen and his Laotian counterpart meeting focused on bilateral relations and enhancing cooperation between the two nations in the post-COVID-19 socio-economic, as well as exchanging views on regional and international issues. The aim of the two-day meeting is to work on a long-lasting comprehensive strategic partnership and enhance cooperation between the two countries, as well as within the ASEAN framework for peace, stability and prosperity in the region.
Minister Hun Sen has received a courtesy visit from Lao Prime Minister Pan Kambi Panban at the Peace Palace on Monday. Prime Minister Hun Sen's personal assistant Iyang Supalit says that Pan Kambi Panban has congratulated the Kingdom of Cambodia's development. He stresses that his current visit shows Cambodia is progressing, especially Phnom Penh. The Prime Minister of Laos also congratulated the Cambodian Prime Minister on his success in all fields, including the recent Asia-Europe meeting and the upcoming ASEAN chairmanship next year. In this regard, he has also expressed his support and promised to cooperate and help Cambodia to lead ASEAN success in the future. Prime Minister Vipanvan has mentioned that Cambodia and Laos have a long history of friendly relations and culture and the traditions. He has also added that Cambodia and Laos may have changed, but the spirit of people to people remains the same. The Lao Prime Minister has made eight requests to Prime Minister Hun Sen. First is to expand and strengthen cooperation with each other, to continue the exchange of visits between the two nations, and to promote the completion of previously agreed work. Second, continue to discuss and negotiate how to complete the cooperation agreement and the comprehensive partnership. Third, to continue the meeting through the existing mechanisms. Fourth, continue to urge the Joint Boundary Commission to continue working to achieve the goals achieved by the leadership. Fifth, to promote trade cooperation between the two countries. Sixth, to promote cooperation in the fields of education, culture and tourism, as well as other areas that are potential for both countries. Seventh, promoting the private sector the investment between the two countries and supporting investors between the two nations, and lastly, promoting cooperation in regional and international forums. In response, Prime Minister Hun Sen has thanked Prime Minister Pan Kambi Panban for supporting Cambodia as the chair of ASEAN and attending the ASEM meeting, supporting Cambodia as the previous ASEM chair, which made Cambodia successful. The Cambodian Prime Minister fully supported the eight points raised by his Lao counterpart in the field of tourism. The Prime Minister of Cambodia asked Prime Minister Vipan Van to consider allowing the two people to travel to each other, as this is mutually complementary sector. Prime Minister Hun Sen has also expressed support in the investment sector to encourage and support investments between the two countries, as investment is the basis for strengthening political cooperation. Prime Minister Hun Sen took the chance to inform Lao Prime Minister Pan Kambi Van Van of Cambodia's assistance to Laos in the amount of $13 million, of which the $3 million comes from the Royal Government of Cambodia's budget and $10 million from philanthropists. The Kingdom of Cambodia has also provided with 500,000 doses of Sinovac vaccine and two vaccination vehicles to the Lao People's Democratic Republic. The Lao Prime Minister has also expressed his condolences to the death of Prince Norodom Ranarit, to the royal family, and to the whole Kingdom of Cambodia. The World Health Organization in Cambodia has warned against the possible surge of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. This new variant was first reported to the WHO in South Africa on November the 24th and is now being discovered in countries around the world. The WHO has labeled it a variant of concern after identifying a large number of mutations. Preliminary evidence also suggests that the variant could be more transmissible and pose increased risk of infection. EAC news reporter Dushana Gochan has the story. The WHO in Cambodia has issued a statement regarding the new variant of concern, stating that there is a high risk that Omicron will be imported and soon found in the Cambodian community in this highly interconnected world. The WHO stresses that the Omicron variant has a large number of mutations, some of which are quite concerning, with early evidence suggesting that this particular variant of concern could be more easily transmissible and also pose an increased risk of reinfection. On a positive note, the WHO stated that PCR diagnostics continue to be effective in detecting the Omicron variant, ensuring that its spread can be efficiently tracked. However, they still emphasize the need for caution and vigilance among citizens. WHO representative to Cambodia, Dr. Lee Ailan, has stated that Cambodia should be concerned about the newly detected variant of concern, Omicron, despite the high COVID-19 vaccination coverage. She further added that everyone should be ready for a possible surge and we should continue to learn and adjust our response measures. In response to the growing global alarm over the new variant, the Cambodian Ministry of Health has said that they do not yet plan to ban entry of flights from certain African or European countries where the Omicron variant has been detected. 
Ministry of Health spokesperson Ao Van Din has stated that Cambodia has now entered the new normal, and this must be maintained for the sake of stability. She has stated that since the country has opened up, there are no plans to suddenly close again. Instead, Ao Van Din has stated that more attention will be paid to the entry and movement of people from countries of concern, including conducting COVID-19 tests on arrival and isolating positive cases in treatment centers. Darshana Gauchen, EAC News. The Kingdom of Cambodia has received more than 188,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine on Sunday. The donations were given through the COVAX facility program. This is the first time Cambodia has received the Moderna brand, enabling Cambodia to diversify its vaccine portfolio. EAC News reporter Yuri Tosco has the details. Around 6 p.m. on Sunday, at the Phnom Penh International, Health Ministry Secretary of State Yuk Sanbat received the donations, along with the World Health Organization representative to Cambodia, Dr. Lee Ailan and UNICEF representative to Cambodia for Ruth Foyozet. The COVAX facility is an initiative promoted by the World Health Organization in partnership with international development organizations to provide vaccines for poor or developing countries. Cambodia has already received 3 million doses of vaccines through the COVAX facility program. As the largest single vaccine buyer in the world, UNICEF is the leading procurement and supply agency for COVAX. UNICEF representative to Cambodia, Foru Voyozat, has stated that through the COVAX facility, Cambodian has received about 60% of the scheduled total doses of vaccines. It is expected that by the end of this year, the AstraZeneca and Sinovac vaccines will be available in the kingdom. According to the Health Ministry Secretary of State, Yuk Sambat, the newly arrived Moderna vaccines will be taken to a warehouse before being distributed to areas where lacks vaccination to people that are still not inoculated. As of Monday, Cambodian has already received 40 million vaccines, 30 million of them as purchases and donations from the People's Republic of China. Yuri Matosko, EAC News. You're watching EAC News. Thanks for joining us. Despite being fully reopened to international travelers, Cambodia's daily COVID-19 numbers are down in the 20s since Friday last week. Six of them are imported cases. On Monday, the Minister of Health only recorded 25 new cases. Cambodia has now a total tally of 120,000 and 112. 22 patients were successfully treated and dispatched overnight. They make the total recovery 116,488. Unfortunately, four people have lost their lives due to COVID. Cambodia's total death since the beginning of the pandemic now stands at 2,935. The kingdom's active cases have come down to 689. The National Museum of Cambodia is a remarkable place that secures history and instills pride for the kingdom, being the biggest museum in Cambodia. However, the museum had to close for months amid the spread of COVID-19, separating the millennium statues from its people. But since the 30th of October, the National Museum of Cambodia has finally opened its doors. EAC news reporter Yuri Matosko sat down with the director of the National Museum, Chai Fasot, who kindly told of the changes and repairs the museum is facing for an enhanced experience for the public. In 1917, the Governor General of French Protectorate of Indochina, in which Cambodia used to be part, appointed Georges Groslier to conduct a study on the state of Cambodian arts. George Groslier was a painter, historian and curator, born and raised in Cambodia, becoming the responsible to design a museum completely based on Khmer culture and history. A foundation stone to build the museum was laid on August 1917, finishing its construction in April of 1920. The museum itself had experienced all the contemporary events of Cambodia, from Cambodian independence in 1953 to the Civil War, under the Khmer Rouge authoritarian regime in which the museum had to close between 1975 to 1979. 
Just as the museum was about to complete its 100-year anniversary in 2020, the museum had to close its doors once again, this time for safe precautions amid the rise of COVID-19 pandemic. More than a year after, the royal government's successful vaccination campaign has given the kingdom the opportunity to enter in its new phase of normality. In the 30th of October onwards, the National Museum has finally been allowed to thrive once again as the most important museum of Cambodia. It houses one of the world's greatest collections of Khmer culture material, including sculpture, ceramics, and ethnographic objects from the prehistoric, pre Angkorian, Angkorian, and post Angkorian periods. EAC News had the opportunity to interview the director of National Museum, Chai Visot. Visoch says that although the closure of the National Museum had distanced the public from its exhibition, it gave more time for essential repairs at the building. Uh, during the, the closing, um, yeah, we have uh, great benefits from this in terms of uh, spending time for the conservation and restoration of the building. And particularly we are uh, concerning about the restoration and repainting our galleries and reorganizing the position of the statues and um, other stuff uh, re related to improving the physical appearance of the National Museum. I think, um, yeah, that is a, a great uh, achievement that we have done in order to be ready not completely 100% ready for reopening, but at least uh, after the government uh, announced or allow us to reopen, we most of the part that we are prepared uh, has been done, except for the restoration of the roof. Um, for us, um, during this uh, reopening, we are very pleased to welcome the visitor, but in the way that we need to follow the guidelines of the uh, SOPs uh, standardization that requested by uh, the Ministry of Health. So we follow these guidelines and we have to be sure that um, we offer the safe environment or safe uh, condition for the local and international vis visitors. The director has also given an insight about how the statues were reorganized for the museum's reopening. He believes that new and refreshing contents might attract new visitors. When they come back, they hope to see something a little bit new or completely new. You know, it depends on, for example, what a new contemporary exhibition that is very really, uh, new. And then uh, for us, uh, at the moment, I try my best in order to reorganize some uh, position of the statue in pre Angkorian uh, gallery and Angkorian gallery. These two uh, gallery completely uh, rearrange for the uh, uh, re um, for the position of some statues, and then I I try my best in order to give the the context to the visitors through the themes of uh, religious or through the themes of the iconographies of the, of the statues. It depends on the context. For example, some we are thinking about rearranging in terms of space and in terms of uh, the, the, um, the, the chronologies of the art, because the way that we are displaying through the, uh, the art chronology, let's say, uh, a pre-Angkorian, uh, Angkorian or post-Angkorian, something like that. So we, we, we go through that. I still follow that base, but try, try to, sh to, to, to give uh, a themes to highlight it. And I'm thinking about giving space uh, for visitor and some part, I reduce the number of the statue. And then I try to bring uh, an important statue that we are displaying outside of the main gallery and bring it back to the gallery. Sometimes uh, some statue, I need to bring it out. So we rearrange it, but sometimes it's very difficult for me while we are rearranging, especially for the early periods of the um, Angkorian period, because it's very compact. It's very um, more statues in this particular um, uh, uh, period, you know, uh, four or five, um, style are uh, combining together, but not chronologically. A jump 
out. That is the most difficulty. I cannot deal completely uh, the issue of this in order to give um, the uh, the picture or to, uh, to to let the visitor easy to understand about that statue uh, because it jumped from let's say Kulen uh, Preko and then jump to Kohke and then back to Pantesre uh, uh, or something like that. So it not uh, go step by step uh, or period by period. Chai Vissot says the balance of the space and the number of statues are a challenge. According to him, there are 20,000 statues being conserved at the museum, in the main galleries, adjacent areas, and in the special storage. He has also shared with EAC News the museum is working hard to improve the lights and the signboards for each statue. You can see the way that I try to, to, to change is equip the light system, because I, I, I think this is very important. We cannot use the natural sunlight in order to capture or to, to showcase um, a statue, especially the massive pieces, because sunlight is not stable, especially during the rainy season. You know, uh, it can be dark or more light, and that's why we need a sustainable, uh, you know, a light system that showcase each statue. You know, this attract me the most because the feeling when we send our statue abroad and then they put in their galleries and they use the light system, it seemed to be the same object. It would be more, uh, you know, um, um, how can I say, um, uh, attraction than, than, than the, 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 the statue that we are displaying in our gallery because of uh, the, 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 the light system. This is very important. The director of the National Museum is confident that in the future, young generations will be more involved in arts. I have known that one big project that uh, uh, funded by the Japanese uh, government in order to introduce art into the public school. This is the big way for younger generation of Cambodian started to love art. I know in the past, we have art, we have handicraft work, you know, activity, but not completely focused um, to art, painting, drawing, or something like that. Not, not really strongly push younger Cambodian students to love art. It, it completely are different from, uh, you know, private school, especially for international school. They have the curriculum, art in the curriculum. That's why I'm very happy that I can see the publication of the book that will be introduced to the public school in the near future soon. This is what I can see that uh, the context of art would be absorbed into the level of the public school to the younger generation of the public uh, student of the public school. The National Museum of Cambodia opens from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. The ticket stops selling at 4.30 p.m., costing 500 riels for Cambodian. For international tourists aging 18 years old and up, the tickets are costing $10 and $5 for international tourists from the age 10 to 17 years old. Tour guides can be arranged in English, Khmer, French and Japanese at the museum's main entrance. Yuri Matosko, EAC News, the National Museum of Cambodia, Phnom Penh. The 13th Asia-Europe meeting has concluded on Friday. The two-day virtual convention chaired by Prime Minister Hun Sen was attended by 50 countries and was heralded as a success, proving exceedingly valuable in bringing closer ties to all the ASEAN members who attended. The leaders and partners of the 13th Asia-Europe meeting have expressed gratitude to Cambodia's chairmanship of the summit. They appreciated the beneficial outcome of the two-day virtual convention, along with its side events. The ASEAN 13 that was held from the 25th to the 26th of November was attended by over 50 heads of state high-level representatives and participants of ASEAN countries from Asia and Europe. The President of the European Council, the President of the European Commission and the Secretary General of ASEAN, chaired by Prime Minister Hun Sen. 
Leaders have reaffirmed the importance of this partnership between Asia and Europe under the theme Strengthening Multilateralism for Shared Growth. The theme is based on consensus, equal partnership, mutual respect and mutual benefit to further advance a robust, inclusive and open multilateralism capable of addressing global and regional issues, particularly the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Hun Sen has praised the active participation of the European leaders as well as the contribution in boosting the EU ties. The Prime Minister has expressed his pride as Cambodia has successfully hosted the ASEM 13. While celebrating the 25th anniversary of ASEM, leaders took stock with satisfaction of the progress made and achievements gained since its inception in 1996 and were committed to the further enhancing and cooperation between partnership and connectivity between Asia and Europe. Leaders encourage all ASEAN partners to place sustainability and resilient measures at the centre of their recovery plans, including, but not limited to, accelerating the transition towards affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy, and ecosystem protection and restoration. Several countries around the globe have already reported confirmed cases of the COVID-19 Omicron variant. This has led to some travel restrictions fueled by fears that the variant may create another surge of more serious COVID-19 cases. The South African president, Cyril Ramaphose, has announced on Sunday that he is deeply disappointed by the decision of Western countries prohibiting travel from a number of South African countries following their earlier discovery of the COVID-19 Omicron variant. South African officials are furious about a British ban on flights from Southern African countries, on which several other countries followed suit. Many South Africans feel they are being punished for their transparency and hard work in keeping tabs on the way the virus is mutating, which started in Gauteng. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says it is completely unjustified departure from the commitment that many of these countries made at the meeting of the G20 countries in Rome last month. He says the action is unfairly discriminating against South Africa and the prohibition of travel will not be effective in preventing the spread of this Omicron variant. He has added that the only thing the prohibition and travel will do is to further damage the economies of the affected countries and undermine their ability to respond to and also to recover from the pandemic. Scientists have so far detected the new Omicron variant in relatively small numbers, mainly in South Africa, but they are concerned by its high number of mutations which raised concerns that it could be more vaccine-resistant and transmissible. The Omicron variant of COVID-19, which has a large number of mutations with worrying characteristics, has so far been detected or suspected in multiple countries around the world, including the UK, Germany, Australia, Denmark, and the first case in Europe was reported in Belgium on Friday, then in Egypt. The Omicron variant, or the B11529, was first reported to the World Health Organization by South Africa on 24 November, and the first known confirmed B11529 infection was from a specimen collected on 9 November. Following worrying initial studies, the WHO on Friday classified the new COVID-19 strain as a variant of concern, naming it the Omicron variant during an emergency meeting. A day later, British Health Secretary Sajid Javid has confirmed two cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant have been detected in Britain, in Chelmsford, and Nottingham. To curb the spread, four more countries were added to Britain's travel red list on Sunday, Angola, Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia. The British government has previously added South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, Zimbabwe, and Namibia to the country's travel red list. And Saturday, Germany reported its first two confirmed cases of the Omicron variant found in southern state of Bavaria. Moreover, 50 passengers from Cape Town who arrived on Friday are now under quarantine in Bavaria, with two of them having tested positive for the coronavirus. It remains unclear whether it is the Omicron variant, and investigation is now underway. On 27 November, Italy has also reported it detected its first case of Omicron on a traveler that recently returned from Mozambique. 
Dutch health authorities have confirmed that 13 cases of the new Omicron coronavirus variant have been found in the Netherlands among passengers that were in two flights from South Africa that arrived on Friday. Meanwhile, the Australian government fears that the Omicron strain might have reached Sydney. Of the 14 travelers that just landed in the country a day ago, two have been tested positive upon arrival. Canada is also closing its borders to foreign travelers who have recently been to seven southern African nations, South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana, Eswatini, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. U.S. also imposes travel ban from eight African countries over Omicron variant, even no cases identified so far. Ousted Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi has braced herself for a verdict in her incitement trial against the country's military rulers, the first in a catalogue of cases that could see her jail for the rest of her life. The democratically elected leader faces years in jail if she is found guilty of charges that also include corruption, fraud and breaking COVID rules. A court in Myanmar is expected to deliver a verdict on ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi on Tuesday. The verdict will be the first in Suu Kyi's trial. She is facing 11 criminal cases with maximum sentences that total more than a century in jail. Those include corruption and violating the Official Secrets Act. Suu Kyi's court hearings are being conducted behind closed doors and defence lawyers, the only source of information on the proceedings, are imposed with gag orders by the authorities. The Nobel laureate has been detained since the generals ousted her democratically elected government on the 1st of February. More than 1,200 people have been killed and over 10,000 arrested in a crackdown on dissidents. According to a local monitoring group, Aung San Suu Kyi faces three years in jail if found guilty of incitement against the military. The charge is one of several these Allen's lists say are aimed at removing the high-profile figure from the political arena for good. The court has been hearing testimony related to the charges of incitement, which is sometimes referred to as sedition. The offence is defined as spreading force or inflammatory information that could disturb public order. But the junta's plans for Aung San Suu Kyi remain unknown. They add, and the authorities could also delay the verdict. Journalists have been barred from proceedings in the special court in the military-built capital, and her lawyers are banned from speaking to the media. Now for a look at the news making international headlines this Monday, 29th of November. A 7.5 magnitude earthquake has shaken the remote Amazon region of northern Peru on Sunday and was felt as far as Lima in the center of the country. It has destroyed 75 homes but with no deaths reported but leaving structural damage. The Seismological Center of the Geophysical Institute of Peru has reported that the earthquake has a depth of 131 kilometers and that the epicenter was 98 kilometers from the town of Santa Maria de Nieva in the province of Condor Canque. The quake was felt throughout the central and northern Peru. Some residents left their homes as a precaution. Part of the church tower on Halca Grande, which is considered as national heritage, has collapsed. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo Terrones has checked the damage caused by the quake. Castillo visited the town of Halca Grande in the Amazonas region to show his support to those affected by the dramatic quake. The president has vowed and reassured the victims that the government is prepared to provide help. He has also said that those affected would receive aid to rebuild their homes. Ukrainian soldiers say they're ready for possible Russian offensive. The army soldier says they don't count on Europe's help. The military trusts and can count on U.S. support. Ukraine believes in the promise the United States gave them and the country already gave them a large consignment of U.S. ammunition and javelin missiles and mortars. Turkey gave them attack drones. He has mentioned that there will be more help. 
There is help as these countries have a common enemy. Ukraine force says they are not afraid. It's just a war. Fear is just a thing. It's a bad idea to be afraid when someone comes to your house and you hide in your basement. It won't work. One should get up and go to fight. It's a luck of a draw. Ukraine's military is confident that they have the ability and is ready to repel any attacks. Ukraine's military intelligence said last week that Russia had more than 92,000 troops have massed around Ukraine's borders and was preparing for an attack by the end of January or beginning of February. Moscow dismisses it as false and alarmist. Ukraine, which wants to join the NATO military alliance, has also blamed Moscow for supporting separatists in a conflict in its east since 2014. Russia has claimed it suspects Ukraine of wanting to recapture separatists' controlled territory by force, but President Volodymyr Zelensky has declared on Friday Kiev had no such plans and Russia's rhetoric opposing Ukraine's bid to join NATO was a worrying sign. Ukraine force controlled borders are aren't fully prepared for any escalation. The president says in case of an attack, they have means for defense and they are fully prepared. Italian scientists from Bambino Giso Pediatric Hospital in Rome have published on Saturday the world's first photo of the newly identified Omicron coronavirus variant. The image in the photo shows the Omicron variant has more mutations in spike protein, the region that interacts with human cells prior to cell entry, compared with the highly infectious Delta variant. Scientists have claimed that the findings do not directly suggest the mutations are more dangerous. On Friday, the World Health Organization has declared Omicron as a new variant of concern of COVID-19. The B11529 variant, codenamed by the WHO, was first sequenced in Gauteng, South Africa on November 24, which causes nations on alert. Several cases were spotted in Europe and governments around the world have announced travel restrictions targeting the Southern African region where it first emerged prompting criticism that the continent was yet again bearing the brunt of panic policies from Western countries. After the break, a look at all the latest sports news. EAC News fully supports the Royal Government of Cambodia's preventative and administrative measures against COVID-19. But we need you to play your part in helping bring the 20 February community transmission event to an end. Wash your hands regularly, sanitize wherever possible. Keep an eye on your body temperature. Use the Stop COVID QR code and maintain a safe social distance. But above all, please, 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 wear a mask. Only together can we beat COVID-19. EAC News' audience is growing. Our YouTube channel has over 150,000 verified subscribers. To mark the milestone, we've received the Silver Creator Award from YouTube. It's given to channels with over 100,000 subscribers. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki says the award celebrates EAC News' hard work and incredible achievement. She says we've brought a unique voice and style to the world, but have also created valuable connections and built a community along the way. 
The next milestone we're going for is 1 million subscribers, and we'd really like that Gold Creator Award. So if you're not already a subscriber, head to YouTube and search for EAC News. Subscribers get alerts when the Daily Roundup is premiering and live events are streaming. Get all the latest breaking news and updates from Cambodia in English. The EAC News channel on YouTube. Cambodia made clear. If it's happening and you need to know about it, you'll get it all right here. EAC News brings you updates and breaking news in English across all of our platforms and channels. The EAC News app, YouTube, Facebook, Telegram, Twitter, and our website www.eacnews.asia. Join me, Andrew Barnes-Roberts, and the rest of the EAC News team every day on your favorite channels. EAC News, Cambodia made clear. Members of the Qatar national soccer team took time out from their preparations for the Arab Cup on Sunday to hold a training session with some tournament volunteers. The 16-team competition runs over the next three weeks and is a dress rehearsal for next year's World Cup, which will take place in the Middle East for the first time. Qatar has spent the last decade preparing for one of the biggest events in the world, building state-of-the-art stadiums and commissioning infrastructure projects worth billions of dollars. Uh, I think this is a nice experience to be participating in the Arab Cup, and uh, it's going to be in the same facilities as the World Cup. And uh, it's going to be a nice experience also to, uh, to be ready for the World Cup. The 5,000 volunteers for the Arab Cup will be drawn from Qatar's diverse expat population, with dozens of nationalities represented, as well as a small number of people coming from overseas. Uh, I would really recommend other people to become volunteers. It's uh, like you learn a lot, you gain a lot, and you also give your skills and what you have. And you meet people from all over the world. It's like a big melting pot, one big happy family. More than 35,000 people apply to be a volunteer, with those chosen helping fans, players and media at the tournament, which will end on December the 18th, exactly a year before the World Cup final. Taiwan's Chang Shi Chang made a four foot par putt on the final hole to win the $1 million Blue Canyon Phuket Championship on Sunday, as the Asian Tour returned for action for the first time in almost two years. Chan pit playing partner Saddam Kawanja for the 180,000 first prize as he finished on 18 under for the tournament, one shot clear of the Thai golfer. Sadon Kao Kanjana had looked set to take the tournament into a playoff, but had his first dropped shot of the day when he missed a six-foot par putt on the last hole, dropping him into a share for second with South Korea's Kim Joo Hyun. Chan has started the day tied for the lead with Siwon Kim from the United States and the American appeared to be cruising to the title, despite starting his final round with a buggy. Kim reached the 10th 4-under for the day, after a run of three successive birdies from the 8th and, at one point, he held a 3-shot lead. That all changed on the back 9. A buggy at the par 4 13th reduced Kim's lead to a single stroke and by the time he had rolled out at the 15th, the 33-year-old was in a 3-way tie with Saddam and Chen who had pulled level on 17 under after both birded the par 5. Saddam and Chen then birded the 16th to leave Kim adrift for the first time, and a buggy at the par 3 17th meant he eventually finished in a 4-way tie for 4th. That turned the tournament into a final hole shootout and, after both Chen and Saddam missed the green with their approach shots, the Taiwanese golfer claimed the title when he rolled in his par putt following Saddam's miss. The event was the first on the Asian Tour since the Malaysian Open in March 2020 due to the ongoing pandemic. 
It comes a month after the organization announced it will be launching 10 new events in 2022 in partnership with Leave Golf Investments, a company backed by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund worth a total of $200 million. Now let's have a look at the weather and see what you can expect for tomorrow. And finally, watched by tourists and locals, thousands of monkeys in Lopburi, central Thailand, feasted on two tons of fruit and vegetables on Sunday. This was the start of the town's monkey festival, which resumed following a two-year hiatus caused by the pandemic. Hundreds of macaques, also known as long-tailed monkeys, were seen climbing on people and stacks of fruit munching away on bananas and pineapples. It's the first time in two years that monkeys get to eat various kinds of fruits and vegetables, and I'm happy for them. The feast, which cost over $3,000, is an annual tradition for locals to thank the monkeys for doing their part in drawing in tourists to Lukburi, which is sometimes known as Monkey Province. The theme for this year's festival was Wheelchair Monkeys Party, and organizer Yungyut Kitwata Nanunsut planned to donate 100 wheelchairs to the needy. Today is the 33rd time that we held this event. This year, under the theme of Wheelchair Monkey Party, where we will donate 100 wheelchairs to people in need. I would say the event is very successful. Many Thais and tourists are visiting. Tourists have been gradually returning to Thailand after the government launched a quarantine-free travel scheme for vaccinated tourists in November, and the festival proved a popular draw. And we came here uh, like yesterday, and so we, uh, we get to see, the, uh, see this, and it's uh, quite much uh, unexpected. And the, um, the monkeys are, are quite... Um, the, uh, the monkeys are quite uh, silly, <laughs> right? And uh, so uh, I'm really happy to, to get to see this. Uh, and now I'm thinking about uh, like uh, going for the next uh, festival. Thailand saw more than 100,000 inbound travelers in November, as high as the number of arrivals in the first 10 months combined. Thank you for watching the Daily Roundup here on the EAC News Channel. For more breaking news and updates, check out our website, eacnews.asia, or search EAC News on Telegram or at your favorite app store. More from the EAC News team tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We'll see you then.